So we have a lot of problems and not enough love to go around, it seems. The world of geopolitics has shifted and churned with some explosive consequences for investors in this environment. Tina Fordham is the perfect guest to guide us through these events. She's a geopolitical analyst and founder of Fordham Global Foresight. Tina. <laughs> Tina, great that you've joined us. I know you travelled to be here with us. I also know that you've analysed many previous geopolitical, political shocks, regime shifts across the globe. But what's peculiar about where we are right now? This particular juncture is a, a place we've never been before. Um, in, in my world, someone who is a political scientist and has worked with investors on the research side for a couple of decades, um, we tend to look uh, into the past for historical comparisons. Um, and the truth is that people investing today, if they're under the age of 70, haven't experienced this combination of factors, even if we're only looking at inflation and, and rate hikes, right? If we add to that the geopolitical volatility, uh, which has frankly been suppressed by central marks, central banks in the last uh, couple of, well, 15 years or so, we've never had to deal with this constellation of factors. So we really are without a map. So we don't have a map, but you've got a map. You've structured your thoughts around this. So over to you, Tina, as you set it up for us. Thank you. Well, um, what I'm going to do is try to provide a, a compass bearing uh, for where we find ourselves. Uh, in the past, when investors were used to um, thinking about geopolitics as uh, something on the list of due diligence factors that they should go through rather than a, a prominent force in investment decisions, um, I used to really have to get their attention. Now that's no longer the case. So with that in mind, I'd like to start out with a, a little bit of perspective, right? Uh, on the idea of providing a compass bearing for where we are, Let's remember that the times that we have all grown up in, personally and professionally, are actually the most peaceful and prosperous ever in human history. So on this Venn diagram, the world is unquestionably better than it's ever been. But as investors, where we're paid by our clients to think about the risk factors, in the world of geopolitics and social change, and I like to look at the intersection between these two, uh, it's complicated. Where we are is, is as we say here, um, in the most complex part. And what I suggest we, we focus on uh, when we, it seems like we are overwhelmed by, by noise, by risk factors, where is the signal, uh, are where we see reversals in the change in trend. So I'm going to go through a few ideas here just to set the scene and the way that I think about uh, the geopolitical environment. Uh, we're used to thinking about slowing growth, the cost of living, monetary policy in, in flux, and market performance. Are we at the end of the bull market? I suggest that we look at the factors I've highlighted here as well. What does it really mean to talk about political fragmentation? Uh, it means, for example, that governments don't have the legitimacy to make big decisions the way that they used to? What about generational divides? Uh, of course, uh, demographics are a driver of growth, but they can also be a driver for um, protests, as we're seeing in Iran, which has a very strong uh, youth population that are now coming out into the streets. The thing that might surprise you a little bit on here is the role of low trust. One of the factors that really drove pandemic response in different countries was declining trust, whether it's in the media and our sources of information, government, uh, or in each other in society. The ban that Reform talked about not enough love to go around, and maybe you didn't want to wear your mask if you didn't have enough love uh, or thought for your fellow humans. I'm suggesting that in the, the new um, paradigm that we've entered, we've got to cast a wider net when we think about which factors matter. Of course, that's easier said than done. So here I've highlighted the kinds of things that are more concrete that we should be looking for. What's the business impact? What's the impact on my portfolios? Well, some, uh, some connections, some correlations are easier to draw than others. Uh, for example, inflation and strikes and protests. Um, this is something that every developed uh, economy is going to have to contend with, the way that they, um, uh, they uh, advance um, benefits in an inflationary environment. I'm based in the UK, where we have seen uh, 
just in the last week, the turmoil that can result when a government doesn't adequately pay attention to that backdrop uh, of markets, economic and fiscal policy, and public expectations, which have changed a great deal since the pandemic, so that the public expects a stronger government response in the face of crisis. That means uh, that um, uh, debt is going to stay high and probably there'll be a drag on growth. But don't worry, as fortune favors the brave, as Louis Pasteur liked to say, um, chance favors the prepared mind. I am a believer in the idea that um, volatility can mean opportunity, but what we can't afford to do is relegate our thinking about social and political factors uh, because we can't model them very easily into things that we put to one side. At the center of my great wall of worry bingo card, uh, I've got the three um, recent shocks that we've had to deal with, the global financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis, the pandemic, obviously, the, the after effects of which we're still contending with, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Why do I highlight these three? Because they are the crises that have become systemic, that have had an impact on markets, on currencies, on the cost of living, and then kind of reverberate out into the other factors. Now, each of these that we could highlight, we could talk about for a long time. What's the risk that China invades Taiwan? It might have been lower at the start of the year uh, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We might now start to think about how that risk calculus has changed if China thinks that its window for reunification, as Beijing sees it, um, is narrowing. One of the things that we can observe from the past, of course, is that when times get more complex uh, and actors feel under more pressure, they may actually take advantage of a narrowing window to do more. I've just come from Dublin talking to investors, for example, about reunification of Ireland, uh, something small that is now probably more likely and considerably more likely than it was 10 years ago. And so when we look at the macro outlook in all of its complexity, uh, it is bound to have and inevitably will have a whole range of smaller, more modest consequences. Here is the, uh, my sort of geopolitical solar system. I used to talk about the USA and China as being frenemies. Uh, the idea that they had some things that they were in competition on, uh, others that they were uh, in cooperation on, like climate. Now I don't think the frenemies uh, construct really serves. Um, both China and Russia had one big thing in common, and that is that they wanted to challenge U.S. hegemony, uh, particularly the global institutions that have really underpinned the stability that we've all become used to in the global financial system and in the globalization of markets. I think one of the more interesting consequences now in the early aftermath of the pandemic, though, is that the West isn't over. It became very fashionable to talk about the rise of the rest in EM, the kind of inevitable, inevitable eclipse of China. Um, and certainly one factor in Putin's decision making was what he regarded as a fairly shambolic response to the pandemic in Europe and the US. The, the fairly united and swift response to that invasion, I think, puts collaboration and cooperation between the US and the European Union firmly back on the map, uh, and that changes the balance of power. We've had news from OPEC today, which you can see I've kind of got as a, as a moon in my solar system. Um, OPEC seems to be aligning with Russia, and that is sure to cause more reverberations in markets, as we saw the recent announcement of a production cut. But overall, our big EM countries, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, and others, India even more so, which is why I put it on its own, um, haven't taken a position really on this new um, balance of power, right? They're sitting it out and they haven't yet been forced to do that. I wanna say just a couple of words about the United States, where I come from, although I haven't lived there for a long time. You're used as investors to being presented with 
the red and the blue, the donkey and the, and the elephant, the Republican Party and the Democrats, uh, and asking one question, who's going to win? And again, referring back to our compass bearing, it's complicated. I wanted to show you a couple of other survey questions that might surprise you if you're not American, maybe even if you are American. Fully 70% of Americans think the country is going in the wrong direction. Now, that is normally a massive alarm bell when it comes to U.S. public opinion. And as you can also see, a very considerable percentage of Americans think the country is headed for a civil war. That, I suggest, is of huge significance. Now, I'm not predicting that that's what's going to happen, but whether it's the midterms in November or 2024, we shouldn't expect the path of U.S. elections to take the sort of predictable course that we've become used to. Because the fact is that the U.S. always used to define itself as an exceptional country. I'm suggesting perhaps some uh, aspects of that exceptionalism are negative. And I'll give you one example. That is the, the first time in the history of, uh, of the world that United States uh, population's life expectancy has gone in the wrong direction. Is it all bad news? It's definitely not. And I know that others will be talking about climate and the new report talks about this. One of the biggest and potentially most positive con consequences of what is otherwise a humanitarian and a geopolitical disaster with the Russian invasion of Ukraine is its acceleration uh, to um, non-Russian sources of energy and to the green transition. Uh, I think this month, October, for the first time in history, Europe isn't receiving Russian gas, perhaps due in some part to that sabotage of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. But sometimes it does take a crisis to accelerate positive trends as well, and that's one. I'm going to finish on this idea of where we go from here. I think uh, as investors and uh, given that the private sector uh, has emerged from the pandemic crisis as being one of the most trusted actors, um, we can actually capitalize upon that public trust uh, to lead the conversation and to lead the change. My own suggestion, and this is something that I'm developing in my research, is that we all need to invest in our own PQ, right? You know what? IQ is, obviously, it's your intelligence in management. We talk about EQ. We need to develop our political quotient. And as we have benefited from growing up in such peaceful and prosperous times, we need to attune our antenna a bit more sharply so that we are better able to anticipate developments that might not be recognizable to us from our personal experience. Thank you. Well, some hard-hitting statements there from Tina on where we're headed and what our options might be. Many options on that universe that we saw. Now, let's integrate Tina's analysis with some economic and financial insights to ask, is globalization coming to a standstill? Peter van der Valle is a strategist in the Rubika multi-assets team. He's also one of the lead authors of the five-year outlook report. Peter is also the author of a special chapter in this year's edition entitled The Emerging Trade-Off in Global Trade. Peter, thanks for joining us and for being here. Okay. Could you outline for us what it is that you, you wrote about in this chapter, the impact of these developments that Tina spoke about on a global financial and economic relations, and in particular, this, what you identify as deglobalization? Yeah. So, as Tina uh, just also alluded to, I think the, the ship of hyper-globalization uh, has clearly sailed. So, in the last uh, decade, we already have seen a peak in FDI inflows, a peak in net migration, a peak in the uh, global trade volumes as a percentage of GDP. And uh, looking ahead, I also think that the nature of globalization is going to change. That we will see an emerging trade-off away from a pure focus on Ricardian efficiency, so focus on minimizing uh, wage cost differentials, more towards the softer factors, like also looking at um, uh, trust-based relationships. So of which there isn't a lot, apparently, according to Tina. 
not a lot of yes, trust. Yes, I mean, indeed. We are, uh, I think, experiencing globally a, a cycle of distrust even. Uh, so therefore, I think uh, trade patterns that are going to emerge are more trust-based. And uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen also mentioned that uh, in a con congressional testimony uh, that we should look more for friend shoring instead. So still a model of free trade, but secure trade based upon, based upon mutual trust. So kind of restricted free trade with new alliances, etc. Yeah. What, <clears throat> what does this mean for investors, Peter? Well, for investors, this clearly means uh, a changing landscape. So a declining trade intensity of global growth uh, is uh, inflationary in the end. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really a, a key message that because of investors and also corporates now uh, willing to pay up an insurance premium to safeguard global supply chains, that drives up your input costs as a corporate, uh, which eventually needs to be passed on to consumers. So that could imply a, a higher level of sec or secular force of inflation going forward. Mm -hmm. Now, from an asset perspective, I think uh, investors would be well advised to look into asset classes that have a lower sensitivity to globalization or to the deceleration of globalization. Mm -hmm. uh, what REITs, does that look like? <laughs> uh, well, REITs, for instance, could be very interesting. So, uh, so property type of investments? Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Uh, um, and to the contrary, uh, emerging market debt in local currency is a highly sensitive asset class to negative shocks to global trade. Uh, so long shorts, uh, long reads, short EMD local currency, that could, for instance, be an interesting uh, dynamic uh, asset allocation play. But of course, many possible options, but to, to do one's asset allocation, stock selection, etc., with these uh, trends in mind, right? Yes, indeed, yeah. Tina, this shift to deglobalization that you've described, could it also be just almost a correction? So we've, we've gone too far, and we know that there were certainly some negative consequences to globalization. Uh, could this just be a correction of some of those ex extremes? It's very interesting to, to frame it that way. Um, it, however, it isn't really a kind of a uniform, organic response. But what I would say is that it, it is quite clear that for, for quite some time in, in uh, the rich industrialized economies, the benefits of globalization, at least at the population level, um, were priced in a long time ago. Uh, and if anything, um, in countries like the United States, where wage stagnation was you know, for 20 years, um, that was masked by access to cheap credit. And when that eroded, you started to see that move toward Trump and uh, more kind of you know, populist solutions. Um, so rather than, I, I guess, tracing the history of it, I think that we can expect to see more um, political and social volatility in response, because one of the things that hasn't changed is that countries will still try to gain an edge um, in this, you know, deglobalizing period, uh, and to, you know, to to benefit themselves from the friend shoring, reshoring, nearshoring, whatever it might be. So it's a time of repositioning. So there are opportunities in this transition time. And opportunistic, I think, is is actually the watchword because, you know, I talk about trust. I think it's important. But at the country level, uh, opportunism and not committing <laughs> will, be, will be the operational inclination, I think. Hey, did I think the choice of title for the publication, Age of Confusion, I think it was your idea. So what exactly do you see, where do you see the confusion lying? Well, uh, actually, there are multiple sources of confusion. Uh, I think uh, the major source of confusion is around the origins of inflation. Uh, so even Fed President Powell had to concede uh, in a congressional testimony that they now understand better how little they understand about inflation. It was a bit of a shocking statement. That's, that's quite something uh, yeah. indeed. And also with regard to the trajectory of inflation, there's uh, a lot of uh, uncertainty. Is it more monetary induced uh, due to excess money creation? Or is the current surge in inflation purely due to a negative supply shock or a difficult combination of both? Um, I also think that the changing monetary landscape away from a decade-long decade era of quantitative easing towards quantitative tightening uh, is, is causing confusion. Uh, so, yeah, there are a lot of factors that investors uh, need, to, uh, need to grapple. Yeah, lots of moving parts. Yeah. Tina, so we've spoken about geopolitical events creating economic consequences, 
uh, what are the probabilities or the chances of some of the economic changes then having geopolitical consequences, food rights, for instance, uh, regime changes politically, et cetera? Well, where do we start? I mean, I, I am not an interest rate expert, but I did get a bit of a chill uh, when Powell made his most recent statement because the the as the American Central Bank obviously committed to bringing down US inflation but the the consequences of, of that globally are going to to be quite significant uh, and I think that you know again referring to the turmoil recently in the UK politicians kind of not speaking about the US Central Bank here but politicians elected officials lack of sophistication about the this more complex economic and market backdrop um, creates problems too. They're not used to you know to telegraphing remarks the way that a U.S. Uh, Fed chairman is, uh, and I think investors have become quite complacent actually, and that speaks to some of the other themes in the report. But also another one that I highlighted on the PQ slide, and that's. Um, you know, cognitive biases, uh, this idea of expecting the recent past and extrapolating those patterns into the future uh, is a big mistake. And historical data can only help us recognize things that have already happened. So talking about the complacency that you called it, what else could go wrong? Now, I know when you showed the slides, there was a big universe of possibilities of things that could go wrong, but we tend to focus in the moment. It's Russia, it's Ukraine, it's energy, etc. Taiwan. What could go? What else could go wrong? That that's in our peripheral vision. Well, I mean, I, I I hate to bring down the mood, but it was only a few days ago when Vladimir Putin made probably the most chilling remarks of of any official um, about Russia's uh, willingness to consider the use of nuclear weapons, uh, and uh, also breaking a taboo. Um, by talking about the U.S. use of, of uh, the atomic bomb in, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, even in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was the closest the world has ever come to that kind of confrontation, when you, when you look back now at those declassified um, uh, you know, tapes and, and the memos, um, reason prevailed uh, on both sides, you know, even Brezhnev was a Soviet leader who had served in the army. We now have a great deal of loose talk and a huge departure from what's referred to as the nuclear grammar. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is moved to anything like a base case scenario, but we also tend to be quite binary in the way that we think about it. Will he, won't he? Mm -hmm. He wouldn't, would he? There are many possibilities in between so-called sub-threshold events, and we need to think about those. And I mean unconventional attack, perhaps on smaller targets, and think through what the US and NATO response would be and how they might impact Europe. Peter, given all of this, do investors need a new lens or a new framework with which to make their asset allocation and investment decisions? Yeah, given the complexity of the landscape, uh, they also uh, need to incorporate more softer factors. Uh, and uh, we in our publication also have developed a new lens based upon multiplicity, persistence and reflexivity uh, that maybe needs some explanation. Indeed. So multiplicity refers to the fact that we have been confronted by a multitude of shocks and they will also reverberate. Uh, and I think one element to highlight is that uh, inflation has e proven anything but uh, transient. Uh, and, um, and what a surprise. <laughs> we were warned at length that it would be, right? Yeah. Indeed. Uh, but uh, I think also the aftermath of that inflation shock mm -hmm. could create second round effects. So reflexivity, the response of consumers and producers to this inflation shock uh, needs also to be factored in by uh, investors. So don't expect a smooth mean reversion towards the steady state variables, mm -hmm. towards long run uh, yeah. averages, also with regard to inflation. Well, take it a bit further. What exactly should investors expect in this new world with which they work with the new framework? Well, to mention uh, one element, um, if you look at consumption volatility uh, in the US, that really has jumped. And I think this could be a, a structural level shift. Hmm. Um, but that also requires a higher risk premia, higher equity risk premia, which are basically a function of that underlying consumption volatility. So higher um, equity risk premia, but also maybe higher liquidity premia, 
given the transition or intended transition from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. Peter, Tina, thank you so much. Uh, both of them will join us again later in the show. We ran some polls on Rubico's social media channels over the past few days just to gauge some sentiment. One of these was to get an idea of what's keeping investors awake at night. And as you can see, it seems the biggest concern, as probably expected, is the Russia-Ukraine war followed very closely by worries about the energy crisis worsening. So this is the world we're in right now, seemingly an age of confusion. Mm -hmm.